following program is a presentation of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio in iTunes. Radio program that helps teach you options trading inside and out, basic to complex. This is Options Bootcamp. Options Bootcamp. Options Bootcamp. Brought to you by Zeco. Zeco is quite possibly the best value in online investing, offering a fully featured stock and options trading experience, spectacular customer service, and tons of free tools at pricing that is 30 to 50% less than the big guys. Keep in mind, options involve risk and are not suitable for all investors. Please read characteristics and risks of standardized options. For more information, including special offers, options education, and disclosures, visit Zeco.com bootcamp. Now, let's start getting you into peak options trading shape. Here are your options boot camp trainers, Mark Longo and Dan Passarelli. All right, and welcome to Options Boot Camp, the show where we break down raw options recruits and rebuild them into seasoned options veterans my name is mark longo from the optionsinsider.com as well as the old options insider radio network and i am joined here by my fellow drill instructor one dan passarelli from markettaker.com mr passarelli welcome back to the old drilling ground uh, it's always good to be here mark uh we got some good stuff to talk about here today, and I'm looking forward to it. Yes, I hope you brought your black hat today, Dan, because we're we're taking off the old white hat of buying options, and we're going to the dark side. We're going to talk about selling options today. So take off that jaunty white hat, sir, and put on your black hat, because it's time to sell some options. Yes, well, as I've been told, that's the only way to make money trading <laughs> options, isn't it? When in doubt, palms out, sir. That is how you do it in this business. That's right. <laughs> All right, let's dive into the basic training segment. All right, Boot, it's time to get in line. What you're going to do is learn. You're going to learn how options work. Do you hear me? You're going to learn options trading inside and out, basic to complex. There will be no failures, do you hear me? Yes, sir! Pull in, prepare to learn. Yes, sir! All right, and welcome to Basic Training. This is, of course, the portion of the show where Dan and I put you through some options basics and get you to go through that nice little obstacle course we built over there on the side of the proving ground it's a nice obstacle course if i do say so myself even though i think the the mud pit is a little dry today dan we'll have to work on that <laughs> it's not getting the recruits as grimy and dirty as it should be right <laughs> all right and speaking of getting dirty and grimy we're going to dive into today the world of selling options we've been talking a lot on episodes one through three about buying options and that is the the focus of those early episodes but now like i joked earlier we're going to put on our black hats and go to the dark side of the forest where we're talking about selling options now most retail options customers most newcomers to options come into options looking to buy them that's kind of just the point of entry for most retail customers because it, it just makes the most intuitive sense to them they can understand coming in and buying a call to speculate on the upside of a particular stock or buying a put to defend the downside or speculate on the downside of a particular stock but selling options is a bit more of a logical leap for a lot of new options traders and that's why we held off on it until we got a few episodes in so you had a an understanding of the basics before we dove into the world of selling aka writing options 
Now let's do a quick overview here of the concepts that we've discussed already. Of course, when you buy an option, you're giving yourself the right to buy or sell a particular stock at a particular price or time, depending on whether you buy a call or a put. Now, when you sell an option, you're doing the exact opposite. You're granting someone else the right to buy or sell that particular stock at a particular price by a particular time. And that's what I meant by that extra intuitive leap of or I should say counterintuitive leap of logic for most people you know the notion of of trading ethereal rights is difficult for a lot of people to comprehend but then the notion Dan of then turning around and granting someone else the right to trade those ethereal rights that takes a, another step for most people to really get there yeah it sure is it's um it's a few logic iterations from what a lot of people are comfortable with but um unfortunately that intimidates a lot of people out of out of even thinking about selling options they say oh i don't know you know i'm just going to stay away from that but that that can be a mistake i think if people learn how to sell properly it can be a really excellent part of your trading plan now that we've hit on a little bit about selling options, why why do this? Why would anyone do this? Now, we joke about putting on the dark hat because it is so scary and dangerous to sell options, but really, why would anyone do this? And the reason is, when you're buying an option, you're paying that price, you're paying that premium to put on that position, then it will be debited from your account. But now... If you're looking to sell options, the reverse is true. Now you're collecting that price. You're collecting that premium. Your account will be credited. And that is a very powerful thing to a lot of traders because now you're turning a lot of those options concepts that we've discussed in the previous shows essentially on their head. Well, you know, the question, why sell an option? Why sell anything? Okay, so I was in a presentation, a very, very basic investing presentation that I was teaching a while back. And I was just going over the really basic concept of shorting a stock. And there was a guy in the class who raised his hand and he said, okay, look, I understand the explanation. I understand how shorting stock works, but why would you ever want to short a stock? And you know, a few people in the class kind of giggled, you know, because they understood why you would want to short a stock. But, you know, there are there are a handful of investors out there who are just kind of trained. Oh, well, you know, you buy stocks, you invest, you, you buy a company that you like. But, of course, companies don't always go up. Sometimes they go down. Really, the only reason you buy a stock is because you think it's going up. And if you find a stock that you think is going down, then you wouldn't buy it. You wouldn't just put your hands in your pocket. You would sell it short. And that's the same thing with options. Why would anybody ever short an option? Well, because you think it's going down. Options don't always go up in value. They go down sometimes as well. And in fact, there are a number of forces at work on an option that in a lot of cases pressure it towards going down. And, and one of the simplest ones and most straightforward ones, of course, is time decay. Well, I'm glad you mentioned time decay and or theta because that is a primary motivator for a lot of people who want to sell options. You know, Dan and I joked earlier that selling options is the only way to make money. And that is that is, of course, a joke, but it, it gets to the heart of something that is very prevalent in the world of professional options traders. Of course, the world of market making where Dan and I both come from, as well as most advanced retail options traders. And that is the vast majority of options professionals, people who make their money trading options for a living, trade short premium. They sell options predominantly as opposed to buying them. And now why is that? And the reason they do that is exactly what Dan just mentioned. It allows them to turn theta from an enemy into an ally. Instead of paying that little bit of decay every day, now all of a sudden you're collecting that. And that is a very powerful thing because as we've discussed in our earlier episodes, that little bit of decay every day, that options dying a little bit every day is a significant hurdle to have to overcome when you have a long options position. So instead, if you can flip that and turn it on its head and put theta to work for you instead of working against you, that is a, a very intoxicating thing for a lot of professional traders. Dan, would you agree, sir? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, it's it's very, very, it's a very, very prevalent concept in trading, but, you know, with other things too. I mean, I mean, think about, I don't know, 
betting on a sporting event. You know, if somebody says, hey, do you want to bet on the Bears Packers game? You know, you wouldn't say, oh, no, I can't do that. I don't like the Packers. You know, I mean, it's very intuitive that, you know, with something like that. Well, you can bet on either side. You know, you, you're not just married to one, you know, d doing it one way. And some people don't really grasp that when it comes to options or, or investing as a whole. You know, if you find a stock that you don't like or an option position that you don't like, you might have just found a great trade. Take the other side. Exactly. There's more there's more positions than just buying and holding or buying and not buying, as the case may be. Exactly. Of course, I could see some diehard Bears fans here in Chicago throwing up their hands at the notion of any bet involving the Packers in any way, <laughs> shape, or form. So perhaps that's not exactly the best example. There are some religious <laughs> zealots out here when it comes to the Bears and the Packers. <laughs> really? I, I had not noticed that. <laughs> so now we're talking here about selling options. Let's give our listeners some concrete examples so they can follow along with us at home and play the old home game. Now, in episode one, we talked about buying calls. That was an example we gave on our favorite, at least it's my favorite, Dan. I'm not sure if it's your favorite. Good old XYZ stock. I've made and lost fortunes in XYZ. My P&L in XYZ is quite impressive. Thankfully, the IRS isn't that concerned about it, so it seems to be a, a good stock to trade. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but try writing that one off on your yeah, taxes that's true. when you lose. That's true. <laughs> I did that once, and it, it didn't go over so well. Let's just say that. But now, XYZ stock. In episode one, we gave that example of XYZ stock trading around $100, and you wanted to come in and buy the front month or the one month 105 call for a dollar that gives you the right to buy the stock anytime during that options life for the price of 105 so if the stock gaps up to 110 obviously that was a profitable position for you and you would do that to give you leverage on the underlying and to allow you to approximate a bullish position without outlaying all of the capital now let's flip that on its head a bit and instead of buying that xyz 105 call for a dollar you instead sell it you sell one contract so now let's look through that example instead. Remember, there is a multiplier on all options, so we have to start there. So for equity options and most options that you will trade, the multiplier will be 100. So you take that price of $1 that you just collected and multiply it by the $1 per 100 shares of those contracts, and you actually have $100 that you just collected. Because the multiplier, as you said, is 100 on most equity options and index options. So now you have that $100 that you put in the bank. You collect it. You hold on to that because you sold that option for $100. Now, let's say XYZ stock stays below 105 for the life of that option. It closes at 100 at expiration. What happens? Well, you keep that $100. That's yours. You've just collected $100 for guaranteeing the right to sell that stock at 105. Now, let's look at another scenario where XYZ instead rallies and it rallies through your option strike price to 110. Now the option you sold for a dollar is now worth five dollars. Remember we talked about extrinsic and intrinsic value on the previous show. That option now has an intrinsic value of five dollars because the strike price is five dollars below where the stock is trading. So there are a couple of scenarios here you're obviously going to lose money on this position. You have the choice of buying that short option back immediately prior to expiration so you can lock in your loss, but that saves you from having to go through the hassle of having the stock exercised against you. But in that scenario, you will have lost five points on the stock or $500. But remember, you collected $100 or one point when you sold that option. So if you knock that off the total of your loss, you actually only lost 400 or four points on that trade. So you get a little bit of an extra cushion from the premium that you sold. If you allow the option to go through expiration to expire in the money, then the owner of that option is obviously going to have that call automatically exercised and exercise their option to buy XYZ stock at the price of 105. So the net result for you is that you will sell them the stock at 105. Coming out of expiration will instead have a net short stock position from 105. So you will still have incurred the same loss, but you will also have that net short position coming out of expiration. So if you do want to get short the stock, you can allow that process to take place. Most traders, nine out of 10, will buy the option back before then to avoid going through the hassle of that because then of course you have to have the margin in your account to cover the short position and a lot of other extrinsic factors that you don't want to have to deal with. 
course, is also the the more rare but still interesting scenario of XYZ closing exactly at 105 when you're short that strike. And that's very interesting. We call that pin risk, where you don't really know what to do because the stock is hovering right at your strike price. And that's an interesting one when you're short. And that's a little bit more advanced topic that we'll get into in later episodes. But just wanted to throw that out there because it is an interesting one to discuss and to tease for upcoming episodes. Dan, do you have anything else you want to throw in here on the old naked call before we dive into the naked put? Yes, uh, I do. And here is a really important thing to think about in regard to the naked call is that, and little disclaimer here, whether this is actually true or not, conventional wisdom says, and probably your broker says, that the naked call is the riskiest position a trader can put on. You know, you're trained from day one when it comes to trading to cut your losses quick and let your profits run. Selling a naked call means I can have limited profit and potentially unlimited loss. <laughs> so, you know, as sexy and attractive as uh, naked options can be, something like just going out there and selling a naked call is probably not the best way to do it. And for sure, for most of you, it sure as heck isn't the place to start if you're brand new to selling options. Definitely, definitely not. We'll get into a, perhaps a more suitable position for these newcomers when we get into the options drill segment where we'll leverage some of the knowledge we just gained on the old naked call, naked short call, and we'll apply that to a new and perhaps even sexier position, even though it doesn't sound as sexy as the naked position. <laughs> <laughs> Here we are talking about dark side selling and naked positions. It might have to have a teen rated or above show today. We'll get the explicit tag on, on iTunes. All right. Speaking of the dark side and naked positions, let's dive into one of my favorite positions. And I think the favorite of many options traders is the old naked short put. And why is this position so attractive for a lot of options traders? Well, because a lot of people look at it as a surrogate for the limit buy order that a lot of equity traders are familiar with. They're used to working limit buy orders all the time in a particular stock that they want to buy, but it's not trading at the current price that they want it to trade or they want to buy it at. Well, in this scenario, by using options, you can essentially create a proxy limit order and be paid to do so. So how does that work? Well, let's go back to our old favorite XYZ stock. XYZ stock is trading at 100. You you want to work a limit order to buy it at 95. You have two options, pun intended. The first is to work the standard limit order to buy it at 95 with your brokerage firm, at which case you wait till the stock drops, and if it does, you buy it. If not, nothing happens. Now, the other alternative is, in this example, you could sell the front month 95 strike put for $1. So now you have the same scenario where you've sold an option $5 out of the money, and you're collecting $1 or because of the multiplier $100 for taking on that risk. So let's look at some scenarios of how this could play out. If XYZ stock stays above $95 for the life of that of that option, now you have a put that you sold that will now expire worthless. So it will go from $1 to zero. So therefore you are keeping the entirety of that premium of that price that you sold. You're keeping that full $100 that's yours as a reward for the risk that you incurred. On the flip side, if you had worked a limit order in the stock and the stock stayed above $95, you receive nothing. So you start to see how this can be attractive to a lot of people who are routinely working limit orders in equities. This could be a better way to approach that same position. Now let's look at the other side of this where XYZ stock drops and it drops $5 through the strike price of the put that you just sold. Now remember how I said a few minutes ago that selling options can get a little counterintuitive and this is where it kind of gets a little scary or screwy for a lot of new options traders because now essentially you've sold a naked put on that 95 strike. So essentially you've sold to someone else the right to sell that stock at $95. That's a very counterintuitive leap for a lot of people to make. But essentially, you guarantee to them that you will buy that stock at $95 anytime during the life of that option. You have stopped them out at $95 instead of being stopped out yourself. And for the risk that you are assuming to do that, you have been paid $100 or $1 on the option. 
Now, with the stock at $90, obviously that put is now $5, and the money, the put that you sold for $1 is now worth 5 So that is a losing scenario, however you want to look at it. With a short call, you had certain scenarios where you could buy it back or let the stock go through exercise and collect the stock position. This is the same scenario here. You could buy that stock or that put that you sold for a dollar back for $5 and lock in a $400 or four point loss on the position. Or if you do actually want to use this as a limit order, you did want to buy XYZ at 95, then you could let those options be exercised. Let the person that you stopped out exercise the ability you granted him to sell XYZ stock at 95. So essentially you're buying XYZ stock at 95. But remember, you collected a dollar to do that. So you're actually only losing $4. You essentially bought the stock at 94. So you have a little bit of cushion with that premium. So you're only losing $400 instead of 500. So you can see how this strategy, as opposed to just using limit orders all the time in equities, can be a preferable and indeed a profitable one if implemented correctly. What Dan said earlier certainly applies to this as well. It's not as risky as the naked short call because you don't have unlimited risk. The stock can only go to zero, but you still have a fair degree of risk. So as we do with a limit order, if you're working a limit order, my purview has always been if you're going to work limit orders and give up that risk anyway, then you might as well be compensated in some way, shape, or form. As we move on with this show and in future episodes, we can talk about ways such as spreads where you can mitigate the risk of these naked short positions. But for now, we'll have to just leave the spreads as another tease for a future episode. Now, before we close out the basic training segment for today, Dan, is there anything else you'd like to add on the naked short put or any of those other topics we've hit on today? Yeah, you know, I've I've got some thoughts on naked short puts. And on the one hand, I agree with everything you said, and you're exactly right on, and that's totally conducive with how I view the world of options. On the other hand, I want to talk about kind of the dark side of this. Now, I realize that talking about naked options is already the dark side. So I'm talking about the dark side of the dark side. It's like we're going double color. dark. That's uh, that's pretty dark, sir. I'm not sure if I'm prepared for that. <laughs> I know. I know. I'm not sure if <laughs> iTunes has a rating for that in their store. <laughs> right. So here's the thing. Trading is all about value, right? And the good thing about selling naked puts is when the stock goes down just under well, first of all, there's there, I guess there's two good things about selling naked puts. One is if the stock really doesn't move and you just pick up that premium and you do better than you would have if you would have bought the stock there. You know, if the stock goes up too much, then you wish you'd bought the stock. But if the stock doesn't really move yet, then great, you made money on the stock not moving. The other good thing about buying a put if you're an investor is if the stock falls just a teeny bit below the strike price so that you buy the stock at an effective price once you factor in that premium you received at an effective price that's better than you could have if you just bought the stock after it fell. So I I forget the numbers you were using, we're using the 105 strike, right? Uh, for the put, I was using XYZ at 100 and selling the 95 put. For oh, that's right. That's right. The 95. Okay. So if, you know, if XYZ is at a hundred and I sell the 95 put for say $3, if XYZ stock falls to 94 at expiration and I hold it and I get assigned, I'm effectively buying the stock at 92. That's the strike price. 95 minus the premium collected of three bucks is $92. So if on that day, I could have bought the stock in the market at 94, but because I sold the put, I'm actually paying 92, then great. From a valuation standpoint, I, I made a very smart investment. Now, on the other hand, if the stock falls to 70, then I'm still buying the stock at 92 instead of buying the stock at 70. So, you know, there, there's, there's good and bad about selling naked or, or cash secured puts when you have the cash kind of plan set aside in order to, you know, pay for the stock that you get on assignment. There's good and bad things about this. And you, traders need to understand that and they need to make sure that that's part of their plan. You need to know whether you're a trader or an investor. If you're an investor, then it's OK to say, oh, well, you know, that's OK. I kind of wanted to buy the stock there anyway. It really stinks that I bought it at 92 and I could have bought it at 70. You know, I mean, you you haven't made a very 
fantastic investment, but you can justify it. If you're a trader and what your real motivation is to just collect that premium and not actually take assignment, then you can't use that excuse of saying, oh yeah, but I would have bought it there anyway. Because if you're not an investor, if you're just a trader trying to just steal that premium out of the market, you didn't want to buy the stock anyway. So, you know, there's a, there's some planning involved in there and and you really have to make sure that you're making the best valuation play as possible for your lot in life, trader or investor. If the market moves too much higher as a trader or an investor, you're not really thrilled that you took just that teeny little premium when you could have done more if you bought the stock or bought a call. And if the market falls too much, you're definitely not happy if you're a trader. And, and if you trick yourself into being happy, you're doing yourself a disservice. And probably you're not super happy if you're an investor either, but maybe you can justify it at, the, at that point. Good tidbits as always, Dan. Good things to keep in mind. And like we do tell that to all people who come to the Options Insider looking for information on naked short puts, it does break down as trading versus investing. You're right. If you're very comfortable buying the stock at those levels, then you probably are much more much happier with the end result of the position as opposed to some, someone who's just diving in and out to try to collect that premium. Of course, as we all saw back on May 6th, just working limit orders has inherent risks. So if you're going to do that as an equity trader, you might as well be compensated in some way, shape, or form for taking that risk that we all know is out there when working orders. All right, sir. Thank you for that. And now we're going to close out the basic training segment. But don't take off that black hat just yet, Dan, because we're going to dive into our options drills segment. Well, in much time for our favorite pastime, option drills. We're going to take the strategies learned during the show and teach you how they can be employed to achieve a specific objective. Do you hear me? Yes, sir. All right, and welcome to Options Drills. And as the man said, this is, of course, a portion of the show where we take some of those concepts that we just learned and we apply them to a few different strategies that you may want to use. And today's strategy du jour in the old Options Drills is one called the Covered Call. Now, we talked earlier about the Naked Short Call, and I said I would have a perhaps sexier application for that and a little more, I think, intuitive and useful application for a lot of our listeners who are also equity traders, and that's where the covered call comes in. Now, a lot of you out there are used to buying a stock and holding it in your portfolio. It's the way most people got started investing. Now you're coming to options to look for ways to improve your trading and to add more options, pun intended yet again, to your portfolio. And one of the things, one of the common refrains we hear from a lot of retail traders is, oh, I love XYZ stock, but I really wish it paid a dividend. I want an underlying that has a great dividend yield. And so they limit themselves to the universe of stocks that have the appreciation characteristics they want, as well as the dividend yield, the income that they want. And they don't realize that they can use options to create a dividend on any stock that they want. And that is through the position known as the covered call. Now, what is a covered call? It is essentially applying what we just learned with the naked short call and applying it to a stock that you already own in your portfolio. So let's say you already own 100 shares of XYZ stock. It's trading at that $100 price level. You look at it and say, you know, I really would like to collect a dividend on XYZ stock. Well, how could you go about that? Well, you could go about that by implementing what we just discussed with selling the naked short call, but instead you sell it against the stock that you already own, hence the term covered. If your stock is called away, if the option is exercised, do you have these shares to deliver without having to go out and buy them into the market? You already own them in your account. So in this case, you go out and sell the XYZ 105 call yet again for a dollar. Now you've just collected a dollar on that stock that is worth a hundred dollars. So you just created a 1% dividend yield for you for that month. Now you have the same scenarios that we talked about before. Let's say XYZ stays below 105 for the lifetime of that option. 
you now just pocketed that one dollar or that one percent dividend yield for that month and the best part about covered calls is that you could do them again and again and again every month and increase the percentage return the dividend yield that you're generating on that stock the opposite of that the reverse side of that is that xyz gaps up to 110 now you have this stock that you own you participate in that appreciation all the way up to the strike that you sold it at which is 105 after which you have agreed to sell that stock at 105 so you're no longer participating in that upside so at expiration your stock will be called away or you will sell that stock to the option buyer the call option buyer for the price of 105 but remember you collected a dollar to do that you are in effect selling the stock for the price of 106 so you actually only lost four points instead of five on that deal also to the downside some people conflate covered calls with a very defensive or protective position in this scenario if the stock dropped below 100 you would have collected one dollar so you get that one dollar of cushion but in reality it's not a defensive position in any stretch of the imagination and perhaps down the road when we talk about synthetics dan we can discuss how the covered call is actually analogous or identical to the naked short put that we just discussed as being a very risky position and when a lot of people think of the covered call as a very basic very risk neutral type of position when you ask them would they ever sell a naked short put they say of course not it's too risky then you explain to them that they are indeed from a synthetic or a risk perspective identical then their eyes tend to jump out of their heads because they, that's a that's a startling realization to them. And you know, about about half the people just won't believe you, no matter if you show them and prove it. <laughs> they'll, just, they'll just storm out of the seminar. We, this man is full of lies and deceit. <laughs> I know. But and you know, you bring up a really great point too. You know, if I had a nickel for every time somebody told me, "Oh yeah, you know, I'm I'm hedging my stock by selling a call." No, you know, that's the biggest fallacy in option trading. A covered call is not a hedge. I mean, to be fair, it provides a teeny bit of a hedge, but it's not downside protection. You know, you, you're, the small percent of downside protection that you get is barely relevant. What it is, is it's taking in some extra premium, trying to make a stock that you think is not going to move a lot pay you a dividend and squeeze a little bit more on. And before we wrap up this options drill segment, I do want to touch on one very common mistake we see a lot of new options traders doing when they first learn about covered calls is they look at that strike chain, that term structure, Dan, and they say, wow, I can sell the front month for a dollar, but I could sell the leap, the one year beyond option for $10. So I'm, yeah. I'm of course going to do that and collect $10 instead of one. And that of course is a very common mistake because it fails to maximize that concept we've hit on again and again in this show, which is time decay and time decay increases exponentially the final few weeks as you approach expiration. So you want to maximize that exponential part of the curve by selling near term options whenever possible. And even though the individual amount you sell them for will be less in the aggregate over that same time frame of the option in this case one year if you keep selling one month options over and over again chances are you will perform much better than if you just collected that ten dollars and put the position away for a year that's a very common mistake and that's one i think we can dive into in more detail on an upcoming show yet another tease you know so much to get to in these shows dan i want to kind of cram it all in but unfortunately we have to close out the old option drills and dive right into the roll call segment right now Roll call! You boots listen up while today's guest speakers are announced. Yes, All right, and welcome to the Roll Call segment. This is, of course, the portion of the show where Dan and I welcome someone from the world of Zecco, and we get to peer into their brains to discuss an interesting topic or trend or discussion area. And today's guest slash victim vi yes exactly guest slash victim is none other than michael fesser he is the president over at zecco trading michael welcome to the program thank you glad to be here now michael why don't you give our listeners a, a quick overview of what the president of zecco trading does in his day-to-day -day activities Sure. Uh, Zecco Trading is the, uh, the regulated broker dealer that is a wholly owned subsidiary underneath Zecco Holdings. And down here, we have a variety of core functions in the broker dealer uh, the operations uh, department, uh, such as new accounts and cashiering, uh, our trade desk, and overall firm risk management. 
um, is down here. Uh, we have our customer service division, which services uh, our retail customer base through 800 telephone lines, emails, uh, chat, as well as we have uh, compliance, fraud, uh, finance, and a smattering of other uh, kind of support positions. But we are the kind of the core broker dealer, the, uh, the uh, um, part of the organization that is primarily responsible for uh, servicing our customers. So you're telling me then that you are indeed the first and last line of defense over at Zecco. You pretty much run the ship. Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Michael might dispute that, but we'll see. Well, I'm glad we can have you on today, Michael. And the reason we wanted to bring you on, because even though this is an options-focused show, we're actually going to going to dial it a bit back and maybe look at some of the, the macro picture for 2012 as well. And like I said, the reason we wanted to have you on is because the brokers have access to some unique data, some unique data points that the rest of us don't see. So you get to have a, a relatively unique perspective on this audience, this retail options trading audience. And you know, obviously last year was a relatively tough year for the market and for that retail audience in particular. We saw the debt downgrade. We saw volatility spiking to record levels. We saw volatility of volatility jumping to record levels. It was a difficult year if you were a new retail trader looking to dip your toe in the options market. And what we saw as a result of that was a lot of new retail traders essentially taking their ball and going home, either going to cash or closing out their brokerage accounts altogether. And we're well into the new year now. And I'm curious because you have access to those data points, like things like darts and deposit levels of accounts, what are you seeing from your perspective? Are those people who may have been shaken out of the markets, are they starting to come back from the data and the metrics that you're seeing? You know, I'm, I'm actually kind of surprised with this, you know, run up above 13,000. I was looking for kind of a greater participation on the retail investor side. And, and, and I hate to say it, but I'm not seeing it. I think for investors who went through the 08 and, and the bottom in 09, that the impact of that has, has fundamentally changed the way some people invest. And for a lot of people, as you said, I think they just took their ball, they went home, they went into a capital preservation mode. You know, fortunately for, for Zecco, we still see positive fund flows, we still see positive debt new accounts, but that's probably more reflective of me taking business away from competitors. But if you look at something like just the uh, domestic equity mutual fund flow, for the first part of this year up through April, you know, there's been an outflow of $25 billion, which is almost more than double what that number looked like in 2011. And what it tells me is people not only have not been participating in a great way with this run-up, but they've also used the run-up as an opportunity to pull more money off the table. The, the area of, uh, of our customer base where we do see more consistency is typically with the options trader who understands how to um, invest uh, regardless of whether the market's going up and down. But as far as the retail, mainstream, longer-term investor, unfortunately, many of those guys have just missed out on this market move. You know, that, that's a shame, but it's not entirely surprising given everything we've seen in our own anecdotal evidence looking at the market and talking to this retail audience on a on a regular basis and hearing their concerns and complaints. And obviously a lot of those people who took their ball and went home were the the cliche long only stock retail traders who really don't have much in the way of alternatives to protect and defend themselves and hedge against market risks when the market does go south or become extremely volatile like it did last year. And that's one of the things Dan and I are trying to accomplish with this show is to try to take those very, very basic novice options or people who are interested in options and turn them into people who can actually actively, effectively implement options to hedge and protect and defend their portfolios. And now, you know, that concept of hedging and hedging against risk is, is a pivotal one. It's one that we discuss, have discussed now on this show for four episodes. Hard to believe it's been four episodes already, hasn't it, Dan? <laughs> Doesn't it? I know. Yeah, I mean, I see that all the time on the educational end of this markets going down that's a, sh that can be a great time for option traders and unfortunately it shakes a lot of people out and and really it should be a great time for people to 
be motivated to learn more and unfortunately it, it, it just kind of turns them off sometimes yeah they get they get burned and they don't want to jump back into into the fire so to speak but that's what we're doing here on the show we're trying to slowly lure them back into the fire and now michael you're you obviously like we said have access to a lot of interesting data and now and also some of the interesting risks that you can perceive from that data. So when you're talking to the retail audience or in our purview here, those retail options traders who are coming to this market for the first time, what is your particular concern when you're talking to them? What are some of the the major pitfalls or obstacles or risks that you're you're warning these new traders, these new options traders about when they're coming into the market here in 2012? Yeah, it's um, it's not necessarily so much that you know we're warning them um, that starts to kind of cross over the uh, the, the um, <laughs> online brokerage. Well, perhaps uh, laying yeah, out so, or suggesting would be a more appropriate term. Yeah, it, exactly, exactly. You know, I, I think coming into 2012, if, if you're going to be in the market, you do have to be cognizant of some of the major themes that are out there. So. You know, one in particular is just the whole European debt crisis issue um, and what could potentially be the impact of uh, uh, a recession in Europe on overall global growth, as well as if you ever do have uh, an economic collapse by one of the European countries, um, uh, the, the potential catastrophe that um, um, could, could follow on something like that. Uh, as well, you know, just our own U.S. economic recovery uh, is, is pretty meager, and, and I think we have to be careful that um, it stays on track. And, you know, just for example, jobless claim, claims have, have risen in the last three weeks. You know, if that's a trend that's going to start to develop, you know, what impact could that have on uh, company spending as well as consumer spending, the impact of higher oil and gas prices? You know, so you have to be cognizant that, you know, as we come into the second half of the year, if this recovery really starts to moderate, what type of uh, impact could that economic data have on the markets? As well as we know it's an election year. Um, we know we have a deficit issue here in the United States. And uh, to my knowledge, we have no plan on how to address that. It'll be interesting to see how that pans out. And then I think, uh, you know, lastly is just keeping an eye on uh, Middle East as an example and Iran with their desire to build nuclear weapons, but if that situation was to escalate, say, an Israel attacks on Iran, you know, what kind of implications would that have on the market? So there are some things out there that investors have to stay on top of and take it into consideration when managing their portfolio because there are a number of risks out there that could uh, derail this market. I like it, Michael. You're starting to sound like me. There's so many Pollyannas out there that I feel like a, a lone voice sometimes warning uh, options traders of the potential risks that are lurking beneath this run to 1300 and beyond. And so it's nice to hear other voices out there reiterating those same uh, potential issues for retail customers out there so we're not alone michael it's, it's nice nice to have a, a fellow voice in, in the wind there and of course speaking of not being alone and as we constructed this show we, we decided to make community and interaction with that community a big focus of the program in fact dan and i have a few questions from the zecco community we're going to be answering right after this segment so we we tend to give the community as much of a voice and much as many opportunities to interact with us here on the show as possible and that's one of the nice things about working with you guys at zecco on this show is because you give us access to that great zecco share community and that makes it easy for us because it is such a broad and diverse community that we can draw from for some options, questions. And I know you guys at Zecco were, were very early on that community bandwagon. So that gives you a really, a really deep pool of users to for us to draw from. And I'm curious what you think. Uh, obviously, you're on the trading side and on the uh, Zecco trading side. So the community aspect is still a very fascinating one. And I'm, what you, I'm curious what you think, or I'm sorry, why you think the uh, the Zecco share has kind of taken off the way it has. Is it because you guys were just so early to the game that people flocked to it because you were one of the early brokerage communities, or is there is there some other secret sauce in there you think that's really uh, bringing so many retail customers to post and interact on Zecco share? Yeah, I, I think it's a, a couple of things. Certainly, being one of the the first firms to enter into that kind of social investing space. 
uh, has given us an advantage. You know, today we're over 400,000 members. But I also think um, overall that, that people like to discuss uh, investing, investing strategies, and that's what, you know, Zecco Share enables for our retail customers. You know, that ability to engage in dialogue with other like-minded investors. Um, or if you're a little on the shire side and you just want to sit back and listen to the conversation, it's that ability to, to participate, it's that ability to gather information. And then, of course, one of the unique things with our Zecco Share is the transparency you get where investors have the option to actually share their actual position data and performance data. And that gives, you know, credibility to a conversation when somebody is discussing their opinion on, say, Apple, and you know that they hold Apple, or you know that they just recently sold Apple. It brings a credibility. So, you know, it's the sharing of investment ideas and the gathering of that feedback that our, that our investors get from our community. And I think that increases, you know, their confidence uh, when they go to employ their own uh, investment ideas and strategies. You know, I'm always impressed and or terrified by those people who are so willing to share their positions. I mean, I, I live a great deal in the public here on the Options Insider Radio Network and on the OptionsInsider.com. I discuss a lot of our trades and what we do, but I don't share everything <laughs> that I do on a regular basis. So the people who opt for that, I'm I'm always very impressed and or terrified of. So it's a, it's great that you can get that level of interaction from your community. As someone who has built a community on the Options Insider, I know how difficult that is and so to be able to to have a mass such a large and also an active community it's one thing to have the numbers it's another that people actually coming in and post and not just lurking and watching and reading so the fact you have such an active pool of users is great for you and it's great for us here on the show because it gives us a great deep deep pool of respondents to draw from here on the show well, Michael, thank you very much for joining us here on Options Boot Camp. We'll have to bring you back on down the road where we can perhaps discuss some of these macro developments in more detail as the year unfolds. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much, Michael. All right, and that's going to do it for the roll call segment. And now we're going to dive right into the mail call segment. Mail call. Time to look at questions submitted by our listeners. All right, welcome to Mail Call, and if, if you've listened to the show at all in the past, you know we try to make the show about much more than just Dan and I gassing on ad nauseum about options. We try to give you the chance to wax poetic about options as well, and so we usually reach out to the Zecco community over on the Zecco Facebook page and also the Zecco Share community on the Zecco website to pull some questions for the show. And today we have two questions coming in, and the first is from Chad, and he writes, what is the difference between a married put and a covered call? Well, we just hit on the covered call. We haven't hit on the married put yet, but Dan, why don't you run our listeners through those two very, very popular positions? Yeah, what is the difference? The world. Those are two incredibly different positions. The best way to think about this, and I'm going to kind of take the mile high view for a second here first. When you sell options, you're, you're selling volatility, okay? You are not wanting the underlying stock to move very much. When you buy options, you're buying volatility, and you either A, want the underlying stock to move very much, or B, you're protected so you don't care if it moves very much. And that is exactly what we're talking about here with the covered call and with the married put. Now, a covered call, which Mark just talked about in great detail is when you own stock and you sell a call against it. And basically what you have there is you have a position where if the stock doesn't move very much, you outperform. You outperform simply holding the stock. If the stock moves too much to the upside, then you give up upside potential. If the stock moves too much to the downside, you lose money because you're really not hedged very well. Now, a married put, that's when I own stock and I buy a put to protect that stock. So there, it's really, it's just the opposite position. There, if the stock doesn't move very much, like not a lot of volatility, 
then you actually underperform the market because you bought insurance that you paid for and you didn't use. Now, if the stock goes up a lot, great. You make money on your stock and you don't use the insurance, but hey, who cares? If the stock falls, goes down a lot, then hey, you might lose just a tiny bit, but you're hedged, you're protected. If the stock goes to zero, who cares? You've got a built-in insurance policy. So the difference is, is it's a world of differences. One, you want the stock to not move much. Two, you either want it to move much or you don't care if it moves much, depending on direction. Thank you for that rundown, Dan and Chad. I hope that was informative for you. And now we're going to jump on to a question from Austin here at the old Zecco Facebook community. And he asks, or I'm sorry, he writes, I have an IRA account which is approved for basic option strategies. My investment objective is to preserve capital and generate additional income while remaining risk averse. What basic strategies can I use in this situation? And that's that's a very common question, Dan. I'm sure you receive that a lot. What can I do with options essentially in my IRA account is the fundamental question there. And you know, fortunately, you're, you're limited <laughs> in what you can do with options in an IRA account. Usually at Zecco is a good example here. They allow, and most brokers are follow suit, they allow up to level two in their IRA accounts, which means you can essentially buy calls or buy puts, or you can do covered calls and cash secure puts. And for Austin, you can't do what would be level three or beyond, which would be multi-leg spreads or strategies that require margin to utilize them. You can't act, you can't use margin in a in an IRA account. So you're limited in terms of your universe of strategies that you can implement in an IRA account. But that said, you do have some great choices. The ideal choice for you is the strategy we just outlined, which is of course the covered call. And the covered call allows you to own the underlying and also generate income on that. That's a fantastic, fantastic strategy for an IRA account. It allows you to boost your returns over time. Granted, in an IRA account, typically those are long-term positions, so you're looking at a long-term appreciation. And over time, you may clip some of your upside by writing calls against it regularly. So it really depends on your outlook on the particular underlying that you hold. If you think this thing is going to be an apple, let's say, and go from 350 to 600 over the course of a few months, then you might want to not want to write covered calls very aggressively on it. Whereas if you don't think it's, if you think it's going to hang out at the same strike price for a while, then you might want to boost your returns by writing some calls. And that will allow you to generate that income that you're talking about. The other strategy you can implement is the cash secured put. And this differs from the naked short put that we just discussed in the basic training segment because by cash secured what they mean is that you have put aside in your brokerage account enough money enough capital to buy the underlying should that put be assigned to you so the downside of cash secured puts is that you're tying up a significant amount of capital to do it versus the naked put the flip side of that is that that brokerage firm is then happy that you have the capital in your account should the worst happen in the stock drop below your strike price. So they allow you to do that. So those are two ways to look at generating income. Perhaps you start off with using the cash secured put as the proxy for that limit order, like we discussed, and that's the way you enter the equity position. And then once you've established a position, let's say the stock is assigned to you on that put, you turn around and write covered calls against it. So you're generating income on both legs of that trade. And that's, that's a way to both preserve a little bit of capital, but also really generate additional income for your portfolio there. Dan, would you concur with both of those? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's right on. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for your questions there, Chad and Austin. If you'd like to follow in Chad and Austin's footsteps, then by all means, surf on over to zecco.com slash bootcamp or go on to the Zecco Facebook page, just facebook.com slash Zecco, and you can post your questions there. And unfortunately, that's going to do it for this episode of Options Bootcamp. I want to thank our guest, Michael Fesser from Zecco, for joining us on the program today. And I also want to thank my cohort, my partner in crime here, my fellow black hat wearing drill instructor, good old <laughs> Dan Passarelli from the land of Market Taker Mentoring. And Dan, what is coming up in the land of MarketTakerMentoring.com that may intrigue our listening audience? 
Oh, Mark, we've got a whole bunch of things going on. You know, we've got seminars, I've got trips, I've been invited to speak to some traders groups, and holy cow, I've got a lot of stuff going on. You know, one of the things that we're really, really happy with is uh, just recently we launched this program called Group Coaching. Uh, we have a number of people who come to us for one-on-one -on -one coaching, or you might hear people refer to it as mentoring, and uh, that's really fantastic. But, you know, it's not for everyone. It's it's for people who really are able to put in the time and are able to pay for it. So to try and make that easier for people who uh, are on a tighter budget but still want to get access, we have what's called group coaching. It meets twice a week on Tuesday and Thursday mornings, a half hour after the open. It's a great place to learn different trade concepts and to watch a, a professional in action finding trades in the real market in a sort of live trading fashion great place to get trade ideas and uh, and group coaching is something that uh, we've launched and it's quickly become our most popular class well that's that's great to hear and of course listeners you can find all of that at markettaker.com and correct me if i'm wrong here dam i'm looking at your website right now and did you just redesign it i see different sections now for the newsletter and for options coaching and for online options education those are all relatively new are they not yeah i've made some changes to the website made it uh, even easier to get around and to find some of the things you need and and if you can't find what you need there i'm just an email away dan at markettaker.com all you're missing is the big player for options boot camp on the site, and then your your website will be complete, sir. That's right. You're <laughs> right. I need to get that up and running. And, of course, speaking of players and websites, if you want to learn more about any of the topics we discussed on the program today or listen to any of the other fine programs on the old Options Insider Radio Network, then by all means, surf on over to theoptionsinsider.com. You can find a lot of educational topics as well as analysis, breaking news from the world of options, and a host of other radio programs for your listening pleasure. So by all means, surf on over there and check it out. I think you'll like what you're going to find. And with that, we're going to wrap up the show today. We, of course, want to thank all of you out there for downloading and streaming and subscribing to this program and propelling us rocketing up the iTunes charts. In fact, I looked the other day, Dan, and we had bumped off CNBC's options action for the top investing programs. And I believe we were number 24 and they were number 27. So there you go. Bumping wow. off CNBC with uh, with options boot camp. There's a lot of people loving, loving the boot camp, sir. <laughs> Fantastic. Glad we can help. <laughs> Indeed. So thanks again for listening and we'll see you next time right here on Options Boot Camp. This episode of Options Bootcamp was brought to you by Zecco, quite possibly the best value in stock and options trading. If you'd like to submit a question for the hosts, visit Facebook.com slash Zecco and post it on the Zecco fan page. Zecco reminds you that options involve risk and are not suitable for all investors. Please read characteristics and risks of standardized options at Zecco.com slash ODD. Multiple leg option strategies involve additional risks and multiple commissions and may result in complex tax treatments. Please refer to the spread trading disclosure found in the options agreement and disclosure document at Zecco.com slash disclosures. The Greeks represent the consensus of the marketplace as to how the option will react to changes in certain variables associated with the pricing of an option contract. There is no guarantee that these forecasts will be correct. Technical and other supporting data on this program can be supplied upon request by contacting editor at Zecco.com. Electronic trading has inherent risks due to system response and access times that vary due to market conditions, system performance, and other factors. Options Boot Camp is produced by the Options Insider Incorporated in association with Zecco Holdings Incorporated. Presentation of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com/radio or search for Options Insider Radio in iTunes.